All right. So under our um, outlines and lectures for module one, this is the outline. What I did was take the learning outcomes, which I call objectives, from this document and put them in the PowerPoint that I'm showing you today. So I'll, which is just this PowerPoint with that one change. Um, so I will post the, the changed one too, just so that you guys have congruency um, on that. Which brings me to needing to open that file. I'll have to change the name of it. Make it number two or something. So you should have already read over chapter one, right? You've sure already done the chapter one assignment. I, as I said, I was a little bit redundant on Canvas. I posted the assignment under Connect Assignments and under the module to try and get you guys to do it, right? If you have not done it yet, make sure you do it as soon as possible. Did I say anything else before I was recording? Oh, syllabus. I didn't finish that yet. I was too tired last night. I was afraid I would screw it up. Uh, but for right now, we're definitely doing chapter one. Everybody always does chapter one, right? It's an introduction. Uh, and then we're going to do chapter two, and then I think we skip to four. Um, but I'll definitely have it done before we get there. Today, Sometime tonight, too, I'll post, although I don't know that we'll even get through all of chapter one today, but I'll post um, chapter two outline in PowerPoint with the objectives in it ahead of time. I didn't realize that it wasn't in there. So. Sign the book for me. Print in the book, because I need to be able to read your name. <laughs> Print. Okay. So, this is our book. Um, if that's all the thing, anyone else going to buy it from the bookstore or purchase it from the bookstore? No. Okay. I have a code for you. So, all right. So, most of us are going to use the ebook. I'm still using the ebook. I haven't got my hard copy in the mail yet either. So this is what the cover looks like. Um, once I get some copies in, I'll put one on reserve at the library and one at the Tudor Center as well on campus. Um, Aaron works there. Aaron, raise your hand. Say hi to the class as a tutor. She's obviously not going to help you with genetics because she's in the class. Uh, but, you know, maybe some of your other classes, you have a classmate who can maybe help you out. So introduction. So what better way to start genetics then an overview of the Human uh, Genome Project. So I actually have a poster of uh, the Genome Project results uh, chromosomes that a colleague gave me. Used to be hanging on the windows to my office, and they made me take it down. We're not allowed to have anything outside of our offices anymore. So I'm trying to find some place to put it <laughs> so that you guys can look at it, right? It's really cool <laughs> uh, poster. It's lots of information. So they started this in 1990. Uh, they wanted to encode our entire genome, all of the DNA found within all of our chromosomes. It's a pretty insane project, right? lot, lot, lot of information. So it was coordinated by the National Institute of Health. So when you see that abbreviation NIH, that's what that stands for. Um, and the Department of Energy, DOE. We don't say DOE, by the way. DOE. Um, I hate when they turn acronyms into words. <laughs> like MRSA, it's supposed to be MRSA. But I do agree it's easier to say MRSA. It's not a word. It's an acronym. All right. So carried out by scientists from around the world. So this wasn't just an endeavor in the United States. It was a collaborative effort. Um, the complete sequence of the genome was published in 2003. And it contained nearly 3 billion nucleotides. 
the accuracy they believe to be greater than 9.999. So why didn't we just write 100? I guess they were afraid about that 0.0%, 0.01%, that one hundredth of a percent possible error. Uh, it provides us with fundamental um, information at the molecular level, right? Um, and really helps us know how how many genes we have. So I just used a word that most people don't know what the heck I'm talking about when I say a gene. So who remembers what a gene is? Tyler. A characteristic that shows a individual part of a mutation? Mm, yes and no. Anyone have a different definition they know? Or understanding of what a gene is? I see the winds, the, it's spinning, Shawanda. You got something that's, no? Okay, so a characteristic of your DNA. A unit of heredity, that's true. So typically, remember, DNA is made up of what type of molecules? Well, first of all, what does DNA stand for? Right, deoxyribonucleic acid, right? So many people, again, it's an acronym, but it stands for something. It stands for a pretty large molecule, right? And it's made up of individual subunits. We refer to those as what? They're repetitive. They make up a deoxyribose sugar, a nitrogenous base, and a phosphate group. Those are nucleotides, right? Those are nucleotides. It's the nitrogenous base that gives us the code, right? What are the letters that we know for DNA? A, T, C, and G, right? Again, that's an abbreviation, right? For a word, for a molecule. Adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. So we have that code, right? But I mean... I could just spit out A, T, G, C, A, T, 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 C, C, G, 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 A, T, C, G. Does that mean anything to you? But it does to our cells, right? It'll take segments of that information and it'll make something from it, right? And the central dogma, we go from DNA to what other nucleotide? RNA. RNA. And then we make what molecule from that? Typically proteins. That protein is what you guys are talking about, right? That product. But it all stems from that section of DNA that codes for something. That's your genes, right? The traits that make up you are distinct segments of that DNA, of that code. Does that make sense to you guys? So we found out, right? how many genes we have. So what do you think? Three billion A, G, T, C, A, G, T, C. <laughs> but you know, several groups of those are gonna make, say, a protein. So how many different genes do you think we ended up with? Three billion cut down to what? Three billion nucleotides cut down to how many distinct segments of DNA? Huh? 48? No. No, you guys are thinking chromosomes. Smaller than a chromosome. Right? Um, they helped us develop, uh, our, helps our cells develop into complex tissues, how detective genes detected genes can cause disease and so that poster I have actually has different markings on it. It'll tell you what genes are affected for what diseases, right? What defect you have to, per se. I thought we had the number in here. Yeah, there it is. Approximately 20,000 to 250,000 genes are encoded in our genome. 
among all our chromosomes, right? So we have 46 chromosomes, but are they all different? No, they come in pairs, right? So we have 23 pairs of our 46 chromosomes. And again, if we look right down to the molecular level, the nucleotides, what's different is that nitrogenous base, and we abbreviate them by the letters A and T and G and C. And they bind in that way, right? They have that relationship with each other, C's with G's and A's with T's. This should be stuff we already know from biology, right? It's kind of hard to get it out of that memory bank, though, sometimes, right? So the, the knowledge we've gained from this project has led to improvements in diagnosis of disease, treatment, and even prevention, right? So one of the diseases, one of the diseases my husband has, is a hereditary disease called hemochromatosis. And it literally is one nucleotide that's wrong in his code and causes his body to retain too much iron in his blood. So periodically, every couple of months, he's got to go and give a pint of blood, and they just throw it away. Can't do anything with it, which really sucks because he's O negative. They would really like to keep it, right? But he has a genetic defect. Uh, he inherited from his um, mom and possibly also his dad. His doctor gave me the genetic write-up. My husband's like, I have no idea what this means. I said, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, it's a one-point mutation. This is crazy. You know, and he was like, what? Yeah, sickle cell, I think, isn't a very, I mean, it's amazing how much just one of those A's, T's, or G's can make a difference in whether you produce a functional protein or not. So we've used this information, right? We've developed new technologies um, to produce medicines that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do. Um, human insulin, right, is not actually made by humans. It can be made by E. coli. How do we do this? We stuck the DNA information from humans into bacteria and got them to make the protein for us so that we can give it to people who can't produce it themselves. In the past, anyone know where they used to get insulin from? Pigs. Pigs. Pigs which are actually very closely related to us. Yeah, thyroid medication. Um, people who have problems with their pancreas and don't produce other enzymes they need from their pancreas, um, it, typically they're from pigs. My mom had to buy like $100 worth of pig pancreatic enzymes for her dog because her pancreas gave out and the poor thing couldn't digest any of her food it just went right through the system she was like this little skinny thing before they figured out what happened this big beautiful german shepherd turned into this little skinny bony thing <laughs> because she was eating but she wasn't digesting and absorbing any of her food or not enough for sure so they had to sprinkle the enzymes on top of her food so that when she ate it, she could digest it. $100 a month. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if they would make those enzymes in bacteria really cheap like they do insulin? And they've gone one step further with insulin, right? Because usually people had to carry what around with their insulin. And needles to be able to inject it, but what else? Could it be kept at room temperature? No, they had to have an ice pack. It had to be refrigerated. This is a protein. It's affected by temperature, right? It's also why it needs to be injected, and you can't take it in pill form. Your body would just go, oh, protein, digestion, food. No. We need it in the bloodstream in its normal form <laughs> in order for it to work. So what scientists have done is they've actually changed the structure. It still works like normal human insulin, but it can stay stable at room temperature. So they don't even have to carry around the ice pack anymore. Their insulin will work. It won't be rejected by the body. 
right? But it is actually different from what the rest of us produce. They stabilize the protein at room temperature. Pretty awesome. So we can do some really amazingly awesome, cool things with genetics because of what we've learned from this project. Um, so, of course, we want to understand how genes work, how they function, right? And, of course, um, we've developed numerous genetic techniques in order to do this over the years. And unfortunately, sometimes they're controversial, right? Nobody really complains about the insulin thing, right? Because it really helps. Can you guys think of any other things that people get kind of up in arms about as far as genetically modifying things? Food. food. GMO stands for genetically modified food or organism, right? GM, GMF is food. O is organism. Um, so even DNA fingerprinting. Right, for crime scenes and such was very controversial when it first came out. They've actually cloned mammals. Right? You know, the um good old is it Dolly? No, Dolly. Dolly. Is she oh yeah, probably. It's been a long time since Dolly. Uh, but they've done cats and dogs and all kinds of other animals. Uh, so the fear is that they're gonna do that with what? People. Right? So legislation has even been passed to prevent that. Um, but if you're, you like sci-fi like me, right, you know, who knows, we might be living in the sci-fi world someday where you don't have to worry about having an identical twin. You can just make a clone and have spare body parts. <laughs> yeah. So DNA fingerprint, again, when it was first introduced, it was not well received. Now it's common practice, right? They're like, oh, why didn't you do DNA? Well, we didn't have any DNA to work with. <laughs> you know, it's like they expect it now, you know. In the past, it was like, oh, no, no, no. That's, that's magic. That's not real. <laughs> right? There's no way you could tell, you know. And um, when I was teaching at Southeastern freshman biology labs, we would do um, DNA purification from uh, liver. And... We'd run it on a gel, electrophoresis, so the students could see. And I didn't realize my lab supervisor was in the back of the room. He was setting up the gel apparatus and stuff like that for my lab. And I had a student ask me, he said, well, so, if I get a blood transfusion, then I go commit a crime, will they be able to figure out it was me? Okay, what am I doing right now? I'm calculating what grade he has in my class and if he's going to try and kill me. <laughs> Not going to answer the question, which my boss later on was like, hey, Erica, you know, I said, no, I know that. <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> and I had a professor tell me once, she's like, don't even cross the streets on campus. Students will run you over. And I was like, Maybe you need to improve your teaching technique if you're that afraid to cross the road on campus. <laughs> I'm not afraid that my students are going to run me over anymore. Uh, but I was a little bit concerned because I don't tend to think that way. But you cannot do that. Does anybody know why that would not save you? What do they give you when they give you a blood transfusion? They give you red blood cells. Mature red blood cells do not have a nucleus. Yeah, so they don't have DNA. It is, in fact, your white blood cells that they use to detect the DNA in a blood sample, not your red blood cells. So when they give you a blood transfusion, though, because they don't have to worry about your white blood cells and cross-reactivity and all that, they give you what's called PAC cells. They've filtered out the white blood cells, and they just give you red blood cells. So yeah, no, that would not work for committing a crime. Not to mention, they don't replace all the blood in your body. When you get a blood transfusion, they just give you a pint or two. Um, so like in theory, I guess, if you got a blood transfusion and you didn't remove the white blood cells, would your body reject it? Those white blood cells could attack you. Mm -hmm. That's why they get rid of them. Make sense? So mammalian cloning, like I said, right, it was done in 1997. The first um, documented case uh, was a sheep named Dolly. 
Uh, but since then, all sorts of animals they've cloned. And in fact, at uh, UMass Amherst, where I did my undergrad, a friend of mine who's now a veterinarian somewhere else, can't remember where she is now, maybe Boston. <laughs> She's a zoologist. She works at the zoo there, I think, as a veterinarian. Um, she stayed on to do graduate work at UMass Amherst, and they were trying to um, get cat pigs, because they're closely related to us, engineer pigs so that they would express the same proteins, the major histocompatibility proteins, on their organs as somebody they, want, they needed a transplant for. So basically grow organs for people who needed transplants. They weren't successful. But that would be really cool if we could, again, make a pig that had your antigens so then we could just give you that heart or liver or whatever organ you needed. So, um, yeah. Interesting stuff. So, of course, um, fears that the technology may be applied to humans, right? There's definitely been legislation in numerous countries against uh, human cloning. So there's Dolly and her surrogate mom. So that was just the one that just dated her. Um, this is Dolly. Um, and then, you know, we genetically modify all the time, right? Our food, unfortunately, is genetically modified. Um, these little mice have been genetically modified to express a protein they wouldn't normally express. They were given the DNA to do it and the mechanism to express it. It's green fluorescent protein, uh, and that's why they're glowing green under the UV light they're being exposed to. And the reason for this is to be able to tag things, right, to determine if that mouse was genetically modified in another way in addition to this marker. So my favorite video, which I didn't put the link in, of um, the fluorescent proteins, I'll have to steal it from my, uh, yeah, I might be able to search for it. Go ahead. Um, there's a research center here, it's called Acres, the Cochrane Research Center, of, uh, I um, they were the first people to put that in a cat to make his membranes, uh, blood. Right. Blood. Yeah, they've used um, they've used this technology a lot. Oh, is this video not? It's oh, I mean, you you name it, it's it's been probably done. I need to hit this button. You want to go back to my search? Oh, sometimes I'm just not good at this. All right, just to I I saw the video. That's the one. But nothing is showing up. Hmm. Oh, here. We'll search specifically for videos. Maybe this one will work. They won like an award for this. What? You're lying to me. All right, I'll find it later because I have it. So the cool thing about this is they were able to visualize the difference between the two different sperm because they made one of the male sperms green and the other one red. And they could see that the sperm actually compete in the female reproductive tract to get to the egg. We would have never known that had they not genetically modified them, one to be green and one to be red. Why do you think a female fruit fly, though, would mate with more than one male at a time? Genetic desert diversity, right? She wants her children to be diverse. If you mate with just one male, then your children aren't going to be genetically diverse. One of my co colleagues here, he loves to talk about certain things, um, says that women make better choices of mates when they're not on birth control. He'll explain it to you in, in agnostic detail. Right. 
<laughs> it is scientifically sound. I'm not saying it's not, you know, because if you hormonally modify yourself, which is what birth control does, then you're going to make different choices than you would had you not modified your hormonal profile. Does that make sense to you guys? Right. So again, you know, um, we can study all types of things, right? Uh, as it relates to genetics. So um, that fluorescent protein was actually first, those fluorescent proteins were first found in jellyfish. Um, why they have that ability, why would they want to actually be able to glow, I don't know. <laughs> I would think that would make them more susceptible to being eaten by predators. But then again, most of those sting like hell, so maybe not. <laughs> um, but uh, so there's lots of different colors out there other than green. And if you've taken microbiology, which Aaron has taken microbiology lab with me, Tyler has, Trevor has, we actually modify E. coli with that green fluorescent protein and make it glow green. So at the, we do that at the end of the semester now, but I'll, I'll, I think I might have some in the fridge from this summer. I'll bring in and let you guys see. It's pretty cool. The kids had fun playing with that this summer in the STEM program that we run. So that was the introduction. Right now we're getting into what you need to know, and we've already kind of reviewed this, right? Um, but we're going to go into more detail. So you definitely need to know biochemical composition of cells, right? What they're made out of. Be able to explain how proteins are largely responsible for the sexual. Ah, uh, yep, yeah, okay. Cell structure and function. I'm trying to talk to you. Outline how DNA stores the information to make proteins. So genetics, of course, is the study of hereditary, heredity and variation. How do we inherit these traits? How do they vary over time? This unifies all of biology, right? All living cells have DNA. As we said earlier, right, when we're studying genetics, we're studying those genes, those segments that actually code for something like a protein, like green fluorescent protein, right? We know the exact code, that segment of A's, G's, T's, and C's, that will cause a cell to make that specific protein. So the gene is classically defined as the unit of heredity, right? It makes you who you are. And you get it from your parents. And for us, it's definitely parents, right? Not true for all organisms. So the modern definition of a segment of DNA that produces a functional protein such as a polypeptide. What's another name for a polypeptide? Amino acid chain that's put together. When you, we put a whole bunch of amino acids together, we call this a pro, proteins. Proteins are polypeptides. Poly meaning many, peptide is the bond between amino acids. So our genes are the blueprint, right? Just like the contractors use the engineer's blueprints to build a house, right? How you're going to build a body is encoded in our DNA, right? What color? hair are you going to have? Is it going to be curly? Is it going to be wavy? Are you going to have freckles? Is that it? Like, you know, if it's encoded in your DNA, you're going to have freckles for sure? No. My freckles don't start coming out until what? Get out in the sun, right? So they're little patches of skin that produce a little bit more m melanin than other patches because they're genetically programmed to do such. But it is also infected by the environment. 
right? So we're not just our DNA all alone. We are also infected by the environment. Anyone ever know a set of identical twins? They don't always look identical as time goes by, right? The environment, which, you know, is what you eat, what you do, can dramatically change your body, even though for identical twins, identical means that genetically they are the same. They were the same egg and sperm and at some point in development split into two beings. Their DNA is exactly the same. But over time, they will vary because of the effect of the environment on that information. And then, of course, their own personal choices. I think a lot of times they have trouble with their own identity and they do the best they can to not look like the other person. <laughs> I know that was true when I was in school. There was a, a set of twins whose last name were Tucker. And they dressed completely different. One was very tomboyish. The other was very girly girly. Hair and makeup was pristine all the time. The other one was like, you're lucky if you saw makeup on her face. And her hair was never done. <laughs> so it made it really easy. Laura and Lori. Of course, I want to shoot their parents too. You know, well, Who does that? Yeah. 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 Very, very interesting. <laughs> Genetics is very interesting. Um, so our traits are those characteristics that we just said. So what makes up our cells? Cells are constructed from small organic molecules. These are linked together by chemical bonds to form larger molecules. So what are the big macromolecules that we think of that make up our cells? We've already named two of them. Throw them back at me. Proteins, nucleic acids, like DNA and RNA, lipids, and carbohydrates, commonly also known as sugars. Right? So the four main large molecules Nucleic acids, which comprise of DNA and RNA. Proteins, which are made up of what repeating subunits? Amino acids. Carbohydrates, which sometimes we also commonly refer to as sugars. Typically when you're reading food labels, they'll have sugars and carbohydrates listed. Are they referring to two different things? Yes. So when they're saying carbohydrates, they're usually talking about multiple sugars hooked together, like starch, or how do we store the, the single sugar we know as glucose, right? Plant cells and, and bacteria and stuff will put a whole bunch of glucose together and that macromolecule, right, is called starch. What is it called in our bodies when we put a whole bunch of glucose together? My A and P people starts with a G too. Your liver processes it. Your liver stores it. Glycogen. Glycogen. So when they're when you look at food labels and they have sugars, they're talking about simple sugars like glucose, or maybe disaccharides where it's two sugars, saccharide is another name you'll hear for sugar, right? So glucose and fructose are hooked together to form sucrose. That's a relatively simple sugar. It's just breaking one bond for your cells to be able to absorb those sugars. Yeah, that's why they have to look out for both carbohydrates and sugars, because carbohydrates are sugar. And what carbohydrate means is carbon and water. What sugars are are a carbon atom and a water molecule. Hydrogen, how many for water? One. Two. H2O, right? That's what, that's what sugars are, is carbon and water, carbohydrates. So when they say carbohydrates on the food labels, that means complex sugars, like a whole bunch of glucose hooked together to form starch or glycogen. 
So those can be really bad for diabetics as well because over time those get broken down slower but they still get broken down into their sugar. They're still sugar. What's the, what's the large molecule name? Lipids, yep. Yeah. Now lipids is the only one that's not considered a polymer. Poly meaning many mer units. This isn't made up, these aren't made up of repeating subunits. We know proteins are made up of, of amino acids, nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides, right? Carbohydrates are made up of individual sugars or um, saccharides. Lipids, on the other hand, are usually lots of hydrogen and carbon fatty acids. Sometimes they have other molecules like glycerol associated with them. That's what triglycerides are, is a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. Those are the ones we look out for, right, that if we eat too much of, they can create problems. So as I said, the first three are macromolecules, also sometimes referred to as polymers. Right? They're made up of many repeating subunits. So the monomer is the amino acid. The polymer is the protein. Sugars are the monomer. Carbohydrates or polysaccharides are the polymer. Nucleic acids, what's the monomer? What are the individual repeating subunits? Nucleotides. So then we combine things, right? We combine fats with proteins, and we can form a bilayer which surrounds the cell and defines the cell, and we call this layer. It's made out of phospholipids and proteins, and it's in a bilayer. It is the cell membrane. So these molecules combine right, to form the structures to make up our cells. At the core of it all are nucleic acids, proteins, sugars, and lipids. How does your body know how to make these things? How do your cells know how to make these things? Or assemble them? It's in your DNA. Right, so this is a small picture though, huh? Right, so there's the sugar, there's the phosphate that bonds to the next sugar, and this is what really matters, that nitrogenous base. So each cell contains many proteins that determine cellular structure, but also functionality. Right? So how we put these things together. So there are some proteins that are embedded in the membrane, right? With those phospholipids. Why do you think they're there? Why do we have proteins in our membranes? What are they doing there? Hanging out. Shawanda, what do you think? Additional structure. Protection. Your, your cells need to do things, don't they? Do they, I mean, that's it? What's in there is in there and that's it? No, stuff needs to what? Go in and out, right? How do you get in and out of this room? A door. How do you think stuff gets in and out of a membrane, though? Diffusion. Osmosis. Active transport usually requires what? Energy and protein gates. Those proteins are little doors for stuff to go in and out of. And they're selective too. They decide who's getting in and who's getting out and whether you're going to need energy to do that. Because some of it will go by diffusion or osmosis, right? In response to a, a gradient. And maybe it's facilitated diffusion where that protein helps them across because they're too big to just jump across. 
can't squeeze in between the molecules. So that's structural and functional proteins, right? They make up the structure of the membrane. They also function in that membrane. The electron transport chain are proteins embedded in membrane that shuttle electrons down a gradient and pump protons, hydrogen ions, across the membrane to then let them come back through, well, guess what? A protein that catalyzes a reaction to make what? Electron transport chain? Electrons transported, but what are we going to make? ATP. A modified nucleotide. Adenine triphosphate. Instead of just having one phosphate, it has three. ADP has two. So we add a phosphate, guess what? That bond took energy. When we break that bond later, we do what with the energy? We release it. So your proteins are not only the structural support of your cells, they're also the workhorses of your cells. So all the proteins in your cells make up your protamin, almost like your genome, you have your protamin. <laughs> and as I said, they're the workers. We did introductions, right? And what majors you guys are going into? Did we do that the first day? We didn't? How do we not do that? I know that you guys have had, you guys that had me for micro probably don't want to do it again. Do you guys want to do the, the, no, you don't want to do the, no, it would be fun in this class because I want to see what we get. Humor me. You can do it again, Tyler. I'm going to put an assignment on, on the, on the Canvas, the discussion board. Those of you guys in micro have done it before. I want you guys to take a quick personality quiz um, and you'll get like a medieval personality and share it with the class. But mostly too, I want to like know all your guys' different majors and it'll give us a chance to do that outside of class and not take up a lot of class time. So I'll post that for you guys. Um, nice, easy 10-point assignment. You can handle it. I know you can. Those of you guys, so let's see do you remember what you got last time, Tyler? Let's see. I was going to say, let's see if you get the same thing. Because sometimes it changes, depending on how you answer. Right? I used to be, for years, I was a dreamer. Right? A minstrel dreamer. Now I'm a shepherd. Every time. Shepherd. Shepherd. Every time. So you change over time. Right? Um, and what you prioritize uh, in your life. So we'll do that. See what see where everybody's at. So um, our proteins have diverse uh, biological functions and the reason why I asked about your guys majors is is anybody interested or heard about our science laboratory technology program here at Delgado? So it's a new program that's been certified last year um, and one of the avenues you can choose is biotechnology to do things like you know develop really cool insulin um, and one of the, the guy actually who's director of the program now, Dr. Uh, James Gunther, his big thing that he loves is proteins. Like he teaches the protein class. He's got all kinds of really cool machines, you know, uh, that you get to learn how to use, like a mass spectrometer and all kinds of other really expensive things. Um, so I don't have a key to that room. I'm jealous. I want to get in that room. I'm working my way in that room. <laughs> so, they also have PCR. That's why we want in that room <laughs> uh, and all that. So, a lot of structural proteins, ones you've probably heard of before if you've taken anatomy and physiology. So, things like uh, turbulin, tuberlin, um, which uh, are components, the, these are proteins that make up your microtubules within your cells, right, which help create the scaffolding to give cell shape um, and even um, uh, provide the ability to move for some cells, especially like amoeba and stuff like that, those, those types of organisms, they're using these, these protein structures within their uh, cytoplasm. 
They actually make up their cytoskeleton. So that's encoded for in your DNA. Uh, contractile proteins, um, ones that contract. So myosin that makes muscle contraction possible, right, uh, in our cells. Hormonal proteins like insulin, right, that regulate how our bodies um, take up glucose from the bloodstream when it's present. Large majority of them are functional proteins and function in a way that they catalyze reactions in our bodies, in our cells. Right? Ones that are enzymatic, we say. They can do the same thing over and over again. They can help out one molecule turn into another. And if it wasn't for their help, Many of the reactions wouldn't happen or would happen very slowly if it wasn't for enzymes helping them along, help accelerate that process. So we have some enzymes that are classified as catabolic. Anyone know what they do to molecules? They break them down, right? I always remember a cat, like cat seems to break down anything you put in front of them, like furniture. I had a cat when I was a kid, and it wasn't declawed. It destroyed the entire back to my dad's recliner. Like, literally shredded it. So, yeah, I, cat, catabolic breakdown, it's pretty easy to remember that. <laughs> right, so we take things like carbohydrates and break them down into the individual sugars, molecules. Right, we break down proteins into the individual amino acids so we can build them back into other proteins <laughs> because we need to do that, right? We may take in a protein that's not the protein we need. We need to break it down and build it back into something we need. So catabolic, again, when we break apart these molecules, we can release energy that can be utilized and as well as those building blocks can be used to build other molecules. So when we build stuff, we are do we're using anabolic enzymes, right? And I always think, and, oh, well, you're adding, right? So you just add the stuff together. Anabolic means making larger molecules from smaller ones. So putting those amino acids, say, back together again to form proteins. And it's a cycle, right? We're constantly going between catabolic and anabolic reactions to either take apart or build things. And the sum of all those reactions is your metabolism. So DNA is that storage on how to make all those proteins, whether they be structural or functional or both. Again, at this point in your college careers, you should know what DNA stands for, right? Deoxyribonucleic acid. For all living organisms, this is how the genetic code is stored in this molecular form. Viruses don't have to have DNA. They can be just RNA. But are they considered living organisms? No. no. Most scientists don't consider them living organisms. I myself do not because they're not organized to the basic level of a living organism, which I consider a cell. They are not cells. Then you could keep going. They don't have their own ribosomes. They don't have their own metabolism. They can't reproduce on their own. And the list just keeps going on and on, right? So why do some people try to argue that they're living? If you have DNA inside cells. Maybe because they have genetic material that they can use to replicate themselves. Right? Sometimes scientists argue, especially parasitologists, that well, they're like, well, you know, there are parasites that can't live outside of other cells. I'm like, yeah, but they're at least a cell. <laughs> right? Maybe they can't live on their own, right? But they are a cell, you know. So, you know, depends on where you draw the line, right? So that DNA encodes the information required to synthesize all cellular proteins, right? All that information, how to make insulin, 
Whatever protein you need to make, that's encoded in your DNA or you don't make it. And DNA is able to do this because of its structure, which thanks to Watson and Crick and all the people he, they spied on, right, we were able to figure that out. Rosalind gets credit nowadays, right? She worked hard for them to spy on her work and figure out the structure of DNA. Yeah, not hardly. So, as we said, DNA is a polymer, right? It's made of many repeating subunits, these subunits we call nucleotides. Each contains the nitrogenous base, so it's either adenine, which we abbreviate A, thymine, which we abbreviate T, cytosine, which we abbreviate C, and guanine, which we abbreviate G. So yes, you're in genetics class now, so you do need to move past A, T, G, and C. You actually need to know what A stands for. What does A stand for? Adenine. What does T stand for? And C? Cytosine. And G? One. Uh, it's not biochemistry class. We're not drawing these things, right? <laughs> but we do need to know their actual name. Okay, so it's stored in a linear sequence. So they're all lined up. The genetic code determines the order of the amino acids. But each little letter doesn't determine an amino acid. It's a code which we've actually figured out. And, yeah, this is genetics class. I'm not going to make you memorize the code. I've showed you the code if you've been in micro, right? You should be familiar with it. But you need to know how to use it, and we will use it in this class. So, how many different naturally occurring amino acids are there that make up proteins? 20. 20. Naturally occurring. 20. 20 different naturally occurring amino acids. How many different nucleotides did we just say? Adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. That's what? Four. Oops. We're kind of short a few letters there, right? So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. There's no way an A codes for phenylalanine, right? So we have to have some type of code, right? You remember those decoder rings and fun stuff like that? And secret codes, right? So we know the secret DNA code. And the way it, it's organized is in groups of three nucleotides, right? We call that grouping of three nucleotides a codon. So notice when they wrote the DNA sequence here, they wrote it in groups of three. These are individual codons. Each one of these groups of three codes for a specific amino acid that we put together to form a particular protein. These three letters are an abbreviation of the amino acids. Again, this isn't a biochemistry class. I'm not going to make you memorize all 20 abbreviations. But you need to know that you're looking at an abbreviation and be able to look it up and figure out what it stands for. Here's another example, right? So each one of these groups of threes codes for a particular amino acid. How am I doing on time? I'm getting there, huh? All right, so our DNA is contained within large structures called chromosomes. So what? anyone know what chromosomes are made of? What other molecular molecule other than DNA? that's usually structural in our cells. Macromolecules. So what are our macromolecules? Proteins. Right? The DNA is wrapped around proteins. The proteins are given a specific name. Anyone know the name of our proteins that incorporate with our DNA to form the chromosome? 
It starts with an H. Histones. Histones. So we already know 46 chromosomes, right? So 46 distinct fragments. Each DNA molecule is complex with proteins. The average human chromosome contains more than a hundred million nucleotides. So remember, we're at three billion total. About a thousand different genes, right? So segments that actually code for, say, a protein. Expression it happens in two steps. We go from DNA, we don't go straight to protein, do we? DNA is turned into RNA, and what is that process called? Transcription. It's called transcription. And how I help my students remember this is that at the molecular level, we're still at the same macromolecule type. DNA and RNA are both what type of macromolecules? nucleic acids, right? So we go from DNA to RNA, right? We're still nucleic acids, right? So right now, what are you doing? You're taking a transcript, right? Probably in English, right? Same language, right? Just a different form. So you're, that's what your body does. It takes the information and it transcribes it so that it can then move. So the most common form of RNA is the kind that moves. The M doesn't stand for move, though. It's the messenger RNA. But it is moving. It's sending the message. Now it's going to go to what molecular complex to be translated into a protein? What's going to bind to the messenger RNA and actually read it and catalyze the reaction of putting amino acids together to form proteins? Ribosomes. And now, though, we're going from nucleic acid messenger RNA, right, to amino acids protein. Different macromolecules, right? So it makes sense that we call this process again translation because this is like you taking your notes and going home and writing them in French. You're translating it. Different language. So when you think about molecules, right, we're keeping the same language, you're just writing a transcript for the first step. The second step, we're doing a translation. We're going from nucleic acid to proteins. Two totally different molecules. So we have a code for that. So again, a segment of the DNA is a gene. The transcript, the messenger RNA, goes to the ribosome. It's translated into a protein that's made up of amino acids. It will function in some way. And it is the reason why we look at the way we do for the most part. Is this very basic expression. So how many people know their blood type? And this is my last thing. Right? Your blood type is determined by what? Your DNA. Your DNA tells your cells to express proteins and carbohydrates on the surface of your red blood cell to determine which type you are. Within our population, for the ABO blood group, we have four different types. We either produce what we call the A antigen, and therefore have the A blood type, or you produce the B antigen, and you therefore have the B blood type. And this is at the molecular level, but it matters, right? It's on the surface of your red blood cells. But we can test for this now. You can have both A and B, right? You're what's called A and B. Or you could not have A or B. You're what's called O, which, by the way, actually stands for zero. <laughs> which is desirable because 
you can't attack something that's not there. And that's the important thing with blood typing and blood transfusion. Don't give somebody something they don't already have. As far as your immune system is concerned, right? If they recognize it is different, they're going to attack. No, it's what's usually referred to as universal donor, um, which isn't really universal because you really can't give it to everybody because there are other antigens out there. That's just the major group that we talk about. Um, but it doesn't have A or B. So you can give it just about anybody because it doesn't have anything for their immune system to attack. Me, on the other hand, I have O-type blood. My body does not recognize A or B. You stick A or B in, hoo -hoo -hoo, we're going to have World War III. It's not going to be pretty. My body's going to attack those cells because they are foreign, they are different, they are not me. But again, all that's encoded in your DNA. I wasn't kidding, I said that was it.